I wonder if they need volunteers for that surgery demonstration in the, in the main hall later. I'm not volunteering, I'm just saying. But, um, so you might wonder why someone talking about banking is going to come out and talk to you guys about you know, neurosurgery and artificial intelligence and these sorts of things. Well, I'm really a technologist. And it became a futurist just by watching the trends of how technology was changing the world. Do you know what the definition of a futurist is? means never being wrong today. You've got to think about that a bit. Then. Um, but, you know, the, the technology that we use every day today is pretty impressive. You know, we, we camp out, you know, at Apple stores waiting for the new iPhone. I don't know if you guys camp out at Apple stores, but if you, if you take the average smartphone that we carry in our pocket today, you know, maybe a new iPhone, a new Samsung Galaxy, and, and you look at the technology that's packed into this device... If you were able to take this device and travel back to 1990 with a time machine, do you know what an average smartphone would be worth in computing powers in 1990? About $43 million. And we carry this around in our pocket. What do we do with our $43 million supercomputers in our pockets? Well, we take selfies, we update our Facebook status, we play games. So one of the things that's happening with technology as it becomes more and more capable, the technology sort of becomes diffused in our society. If you think about, uh, you know, when, you know, I mean, I saw some of the, uh, the, t the screens you guys have to use for updating patient records and things like that, but uh, do you remember the old days when we had the green screens? The old computers with the green screens, you know? And, and if you remember, uh, back in those days, I, actually, I learned to program when I was at high school, I, used, I learned a program on this system of using punch cards, you know, where you'd mark on the cards with a pencil and you'd stack them up in this sort of card reader. Chunk, chunk, chunk. That's how it compiled the program. Um, so I'm showing my age, obviously. But it required a high degree of technical competency just to operate a computer in these day, those days. These days, a two-year-old child can pick up an iPad and be competent in seconds. So as technology changes and becomes diffused in our society and adoption of these technologies ramp up quicker and quicker, we sort of lose sight of the fact that technology does change our behavior pretty significantly. There's this yin and yang. So when you look at it historically, you know, back in 1812 when the steam machine came along and impacted the, uh, the textiles industry, the so-called Luddites, the textile workers that revolted because of the steam machine, they would go in and smash up the steam machines because these steam machines were taking their jobs. It wasn't that Luddites didn't like technology back then, they just didn't like the technology that was taking their jobs. And 200 years later, we see taxi drivers in France pulling out Uber drivers out of their car and setting the cars on fire because Uber's disrupting their business. So in 200 years, this yin and yang of technology shift, the changes that occur as a result of technology adoption, we really haven't got better from a societal perspective in terms of dealing with this. So this is the, the flip side of all this amazing technology that we have. But the major disruptions that are coming actually promise to be even more disruptive in terms of society. So we're going to have to get used to the rate of change of technology disruption speeding up rather than slowing down. So the one thing that I guess as a constancy we're going to have to get used to is the rate of change that technology you know, puts on society. So the major disruptive theme, I'm going to give you four of these, the major disruptive theme in terms of technology shift over the next 20 to 30 years is going to be artificial intelligence. Now, you hear a lot about AI, and you know, we, we hear robotics bundled into this. Um, the reason we bundle robotics into this generally is that any robot that has some autonomy must have some you know, form of AI. You know? um, but right now, today, the robots or the AIs that we have aren't particularly sophisticated. Do you know the number one selling robot in America today? Well, it's a robot vacuum cleaner. About 30% of all vacuum cleaners sold in the US today are robotics, are based on robotic technology. So this is machine learning. This is a very simple capability of uh, some cognition based on an algorithm 
if you can call it that. And this is the first stage of AI that we're seeing now. Machines that can learn, machines that can adapt to their environment. Machines that can mimic a human process, but generally one type of behavior, one type of process. So an autonomous vehicle that can drive itself can't vacuum your floor at home, but it can do that task as good as a human, or it soon will be able to. The next stage of AI we talk about is artificial general intelligence, when a computer, you can converse with a computer. We're starting to see early efforts of this with Siri and Bixby and these uh, voice smart assistant technologies. Within 10 years, you will be able to uh, treat these technologies very conversationally. After that, we talk about strong AI, a computer that uh, could be smarter than everyone in this room. Now, it raises all sorts of questions about ethics and the way these, uh, these AIs will be implemented. Will robots take over the world? But the reality is that artificial intelligence isn't going to be like human intelligence. But there are elements of human intelligence and the way the mind works that very strongly influence the way neural networks are being built. So there's a, a really interesting sort of parallel here with the human brain and how that works and how AI is uh, being developed. So this is the first disruptive major theme, and it's going to affect about 45% of jobs in the United States will be redundant because of these technologies. Uh, in China, it's even higher, um, upwards of 70%. Now, there are new jobs that will be created by these technologies, but there's obviously going to be displacement. Now, when you come back to a technology adoption diffusion, the rate of technology adoption in society, as this speeds up, technology sort of becomes invisible. It becomes embedded in our world. So we'll be able to talk to computers, and we won't think of it as operating computer. We'll be uh, surrounded by automation. We'll hop in a self-driving car in 10 or 15 years, and we won't think about that. Certainly our children won't think of that as uh, particularly uh, uh, spectacular uh, experiences. We'll have embedded uh, circuits all around us, smart glasses that give us information in our head-up display. As all of this technology becomes embedded in our society, service businesses will need true technology to remain relevant. Now, if you go out to Silicon Valley today, you can't even order a pizza on a telephone anymore. You've got to use an app. You know, this is uh, part of this shift in the way uh, businesses work. Uh, the third area, the third most disruptive theme that we, we looked at in research is health tech and uh, gene therapy. Now, you guys have probably been following the progress in uh, technologies like CRISPR and Talon, but this is only possible because of the advances we've made in computing technology. You know, when we encoded or sequenced the first human genome, it took us uh, you know, a decade and cost billions of dollars. Today, we can do a simple pass using uh, you know, uh, gene sequencing services like uh, 23andMe for $100 and look at three to 6,000 different base pairs you know, for, for 100 bucks. This is only possible through the use of technology like Moore's Law. Now, the really interesting thing, of course, is if you think of diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, genetic forms of cancer, heart disease... The ability to edit this out of the genome in the future holds massive potential because we move away from treatment of the disease to removing the disease from our genome. Of course, there are a lot of ethical considerations in this, but over the next 20 years, you can bet we're going to spend a lot of time working on this. But the other area I'm going to talk about in health tech is the area of diagnostics, and I'll get to that in a moment. Now, when you put all of these three disruptive themes together, what you have emerging is you have new ways of thinking about problems, 3D printing to solve problems in terms of uh, you know, uh, food shortages or uh, you know, bioprinting new body parts and things like that. These are really out-of-the-box thinking from the way we've typically approached these problems. Or new materials like nanotechnologies and, and uh, uh, materials like up in the top uh, right-hand corner there, a transparent solar cell. Imagine taking the Empire State Building and turning all of the windows in the Empire State Building into transparent solar cells and what that would do for energy production. That, just that one building could generate enough energy to power six blocks of New York City just by changing the glass 
in that one building. Or foldable screens that we could, you know, maybe a, a phone you could wear on your wrist that wrapped around your wrist like a wristwatch, and you can unfold it to be like a tablet computing. Uh, this would be possible within just a few years. So you put all of these technologies together, and what you have is the emergence of smart economies. And this is really how we're going to differentiate economies in the future, based on these technologies. Just like in the United States, you know, in the 1850s and 60s with the railroad and the telegraph, these were the foundations for the future of economic activity. So artificial intelligence, autonomous transport systems, uh, you know, medical diagnosis based on AI imaging and so forth. These are all going to be the foundations of a new way to think about the world. Now, to illustrate one area, during the, uh, the US elections, there was a lot of talk about energy and bringing back coal jobs to the United States, for example. But this year alone, the cost of solar energy has plummeted by 30%. This is because solar is subject to the same sort of technology trends that we see with the chips and computers. So within 10 years, the cost of solar energy will be less than one-tenth of that of producing a kilowatt of energy or a megawatt of energy through coal. So if, if you don't transition your economy to this, like China and India is doing right now, if the US was reliant on coal, then it could be that we could be paying 10 times what China is paying for the cost of electricity. We have to shift our thinking in terms of this future because this is the infrastructure that's going to make us competitive. Now, talking about uh, being competitive and so forth, this is, uh, of course, our, our president. And uh, if you think about some of the challenges we face, we need a sort of different thinking to this. This is what Trump said during the run-up to the election about Apple and getting Apple to work in the United States. Listen to what he said. We're going to get Apple to start building their damn computers and things in this country instead of in other countries. Now, it's a good soundbite, right? We're going to get Apple to build their computers here. But if you know about Apple, Apple produces their, a lot of their equipment in China using a partner called Foxconn. And right now today, Foxconn is replacing 6,000 humans on the production line per week with robots because robotic imagery, imaging technologies and uh, this uh, automation on the factory floor is progressing at such a rate that they're able to replace humans on the factory floor. So if Apple was forced to build their damn computers in this country instead of China, do you think it's likely that they would build factories that have humans on the factory floor? Because that seemed to be the intent of what was tr Trump was saying. Or is it more likely they would build highly automated factories with artificial intelligence and robotics. So it's not good, great for job creation unless you're a robot repairman, right? Um, so this is this shift we have to make uh, philosophically in terms of the way the economy is structured. The old jobs are going away. We need to adapt to this rate of change. And uh, this is going to attack all different areas. Now, we talk about self-driving cars, but of course the big shift here would be actually in autonomous networks of trucks and, and ships and so forth. In the US alone, at least 2 million truck drivers would be affected, 2 million transcontinental truck drivers, by this sort of autonomous driving. And it's probably that trucks will be uh, commercialised in this respect before uh, your average family car. There's a lot more incentive to have trucks automated in terms of driving than there is the, the average family car. And it's not just uh, in driving. In terms of the medical stuff, there's some really interesting things happening. This is a Proteus chip. It's a, it's a chip that does d diagnosis. Now, if you, uh, if you know about how battery tech works in your car, for example, your car and your battery uh, it has battery acid that powers that battery. So what scientists worked out was that stomach acid could be used in a similar way. So by swallowing this chip, that's on this tablet, when that chip hits your stomach acid, the two components of the chip, they stretch and repel each other because of the stomach acid and snap back together. And that produces enough of a charge to send a small electrical signal through a patch you wear on your, your stomach to your iPhone. And this is how these ingestible technologies are working for diagnosis. Now, obviously, these chips are going to get more powerful and smaller and more capable. And so when we start thinking about medical imaging, 
you know, we're going to be using data in parallel with imaging technologies like MRIs and CAT scans, but we're going to use, use internal sensors as well. So if you think about the, the ability to give diagnosis based off real-time data, just think about the health insurance industry as, as one example. You know, today, if you go to a health insurer, they make you fill out this application form. You know, what's your history? Do you, you know, do you have history of heart disease? Do you smoke? Do you scuba dive? Do you skydive? And yet, the relevance of this sort of real-time data will make that sort of process obsolete very quickly. No business will be able to compete in that world based off an application form. They must have this type of data. So we're starting to augment humanity with technology. Some, in some more aggressive ways than others. This is Dr. Hugh Herr. He's a leading biomedical uh, e expert in terms of robotics. And uh, when he was 17, he was uh, uh, caught in a blizzard on the top of Mount Wellington, lost both of his legs as a result of this climbing accident that he had. Actually, he, uh, he fell through a frozen lake and was frostbitten, caught on the mountain for three days. When they recovered him, they event he eventually lost his legs. So as you do, he went to Harvard and MIT to learn robotics so he could build himself better legs. And today, it's said that he can climb faster and better than before with his natural human limbs. His friends joke that they're going to, get, they're going to have to get amputations too to keep up with him. But here's the point, is in, in 15 to 20 years, we'll have robotic prosthesis that can outperform natural human limbs. What are the ethics of someone who's got a perfectly good set of legs or arms making a decision to get robotic enhancements. We're going to have to deal with this. Probably not in the next 10 years, but certainly in the next 30 years, there'll be these ethical considerations. But we're not all going to run around and get robot legs. But what we might do is we might enhance or augment our vision using this type of technology. Um, and you, you can see some of this demonstrated in the, on the events floor um, today with uh, Ho Microsoft HoloLens. But this is what we call smart glasses. Now, what they do is they present a layer of data or information. They project this into your field of view using uh, lasers and mirrors and uh, um, other, other technologies. But in the future, you'll be able to wear just in, in 10 years or so, the smart glasses that they have today will be pretty much in terms of about at the same stage the iPhone was in 2007 from an adoption perspective. So in 15 years, this is going to be all the rage. Everyone's going to have their smart glasses. And this will replace a lot of the computing technology we have today. You won't need a screen in the future because you'll just be able to bring up a screen virtually using your head-up display with smart glasses. Now think about what this would mean for surgery. Think about being able to see a 3D representation of a tumor in a patient based on an MRI in real time as you're conducting surgery. Think about how this would uh, you know, change the way uh, professionals work in various fields. You know? Just even simply, if you're, um, you know, if you're jogging or exercising, being able to see your heart rate in real time, being able to see GPS directions, all of these things. As we integrate this into our, our life, it will change the way we behave. One example is this. When you combine artificial intelligence and the imaging technology in cameras we'll use in smart glasses, in the future when you're dating, you'll be able to see whether the person really likes you. Because the AI will be able to tell you that. In fact, more than that, when, if you have this sort of imaging technology built into smart glasses, you'll be able to tell if someone's lying to you just by using this. It's going to be a real problem for politicians, I think. But this is going to change the way we behave. Uh, society becomes more transparent as this technology becomes infused, but you're going to have a disadvantage technologically if you don't adopt this type of technology in your workplace. You're going to have to use this to be proficient. Some pretty big impact stuff. Now, ultimately, where the brain comes into this is we're working on direct ways to interface with computers using neural interfaces. Now, this is where we really need to understand the brain in terms of its responses and how we can sort of track that and how we can sort of codify that in programs. The most immediate application of this is you know, for technologies like this, where we're using brain interfaces to control uh, prosthesis. Um, but, you know, some are looking at technologies for repairing spinal damage where we just send the signals from the brain using uh, electrical components to, uh, to the limbs instead of uh, having to use robotic prosthesis. But 
there seems to be this sort of merger between the brain and machine that's coming based on these technologies. But it's not just direct neural interfaces that we'll be seeing. We're also seeing the application of artificial intelligence in our, our daily life. This is how Hollywood represents science, you know, science fiction represents robots. This is Ava uh, AI out of a movie called Ex Machina. You may also be familiar with the D-1000, the Terminator, right out of the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. But the reality is robots don't yet look like this. In fact, as I said before, the most common form of robot looks like this today. But the ability for robots or artificial intelligence to learn is what's different today. In the past, we had to code computer programs. Today, we teach computers to act. We teach them human behavior. We teach them to do things. So when you look at the field that you guys are involved in, there's big potential for this. But the AI and robotics area we're talking about is growing rapidly. These are robot delivery vehicles that can deliver your groceries. You'll have autonomous uh, driving vehicles. You'll have uh, You'll have uh, robot drones like Amazon is working on for delivery. About 80% of their packages are under five pounds and can be delivered by an airborne drone. Industrial robots. When you add all that up, we think that by 2035, there'll be about 10 billion robots on the planet, more than there are humans. So we are going to be living with this technology in the world around us. So I guess the question is, where do humans fit into this? Because we've always thought that humans represent a differentiation from technology because of the advice that we can give, the human factor. The challenge to this is that advice itself is going to be compromised by technology in that machines will be better and more consistent at giving certain types of advice. Let's think about it in terms of uh, diagnosis. When we look at imaging data, it turns out now that it takes about 3,000 samples to feed into an AI for a particular condition where an AI will be able to do that at the same uh, level of expertise as a human in terms of diagnosis. Now, we've used this initially in oncology, um, but it is happening in, uh, in neurosurgery and so forth as well. And essentially, this is where we're going to do a lot of the upfront diagnosis of the condition. It's just to be run through an algorithm. Uh, and, and if you think about this, we're taking the best surgeons in the world that have 30 or 40 years of experience, we're plugging that into these algorithms, but what we're also doing is we're applying all of the medical journals, we're sucking all of that data in, and we're instantly analysing that. And that's the benefit that AI has. It can analyse all of that data very, very quickly. But it's not just through imaging. What we're also starting to see is we're starting to see the application of behavioral technologies in this respect. You know, my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's a few years ago, and when he walked into the specialist's office, the specialist knew, said, within, within a few seconds, I know exactly what's wrong with you. Now, that expertise came, you know, the, not just from looking at the, uh, the data, but the specialist could see my father's uh, posture and the way he carried himself and knew the condition he had. So why can't we teach machines to recognize the same? Well, it turns out that even just voice stress, uh, the way we speak, uh, facial, facial expressions, these sorts of things can show patterns of uh, neurological degradation that, that are fairly predictable. So maybe your iPhone's gonna tell you that you've got Alzheimer's coming just by listening to your conversation with your friends. This would be possible, whether or not we would do this is obviously a question. But AIs are starting to surprise us. This is Google's machine learning algorithm for translation. And when you get two languages like English and French, for example, there's well-defined gra grammatical patterns there that we can teach a machine for translation purposes. But if you take two disparate languages, say, I don't know, Farsi and Korean, there's, there may not be a Farsi-Korean dictionary, so how do you handle that? Well, in the past, what we used to do is we would translate one into English and then translate from English into another or something like that. But Google's translation algorithm came up with its own approach to solve that problem. It came up with its own language to translate between disparate languages. Google engineers called it an interlingua. 
there's only one challenge with this, is the Google engineers have no idea what's going on in that algorithm, but it works. And this is what's interesting, is AIs may not respond in the same way that we predict, but ultimately, because they're pure logic, they'll get to the response that we need. I'll give you another example of this. These are two test rigs for Audi's self-driving program. One called Test Vehicle A, Test Vehicle B, both Audi RS7s. And uh, they noticed something that's quite interesting. They nicknamed these cars AJ and Bobby for Test Vehicle A and B. One of the cars in particular, though, Bobby, they found it started to record faster lap times than AJ. This is not a typical self-driving car. This is a self-driving race car. It can compete around the track with, uh, you know, drivers, uh, uh, you know, racing drivers. But Bobby always gets faster track times, drives more aggressively than AJ. So I asked the Audi engineers, I said, so why is that? Why does Bobby, it's got the same hardware, right? The same vehicle, the same firmware, the same software. They said, yeah, it's all identical. So why does Bobby drive faster than AJ, I said. And the engineer said, yeah, we're really not sure. <laughs> but we think some point in the past that one of the drivers drove more aggressively and because it's a learning machine, that that became a new baseline that taught it behavior from that point on. Now, it doesn't make Bobby less safe as a vehicle than AJ, but it does make it different. So even though you have exactly the same hardware and same you know, software in these things, AIs are going to start showing personality and differentiation in interesting ways by the rate they learn. It doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be wrong in terms of the process. But here, let me illustrate the problem for you guys in respect to your profession using a self-driving car analogy. So this is what a self-driving car sees through its LiDAR rig. You know, this is a light-emitting radar, point, 3D point maps plus cameras that when you put all that together, it can see about a thousand times more information than your human eye can see when it's driving a vehicle. And it can process that 70% faster than your neocortex in terms of making a decision. Now what's interesting is that you, when you mature this technology, what that means is statistically, no human will be as safe as an autonomous vehicle once it's mature. We just can't compete with the amount of information it's processing. So here's really, when it comes to diagnosis of your patients in the future, this is where AI is going to have an advantage. It's going to be able to process much more information much faster than a human doctor can in terms of diagnosis. Now, this is where you guys are going to use these tools in concert with the work you do today. It'll improve the rate of diagnosis. Already, IBM Watson in the cancer field, and there's uh, some fuzzy numbers around this, but the, the data shows that in terms of specific types of cancer, that Watson can diagnose with about a 96, 97% accuracy, accuracy rate compared with the average, which is about 50% in, in, um, in terms of diagnosis in base oncology. This is because... An AI doesn't forget. It doesn't forget a medical journal it's read 10 years ago. It doesn't miss a piece of data on an imaging scan because once you teach it to do that perfectly, it'll be able to do that job perfectly every single time. And that's the challenge that we have with AIs. Now remember, you're not competing against a machine here. You're competing against human knowledge that you guys have collected over decades and we're just teaching the machine to do exactly what you do, but do it perfectly. So you're competing against yourself, but the best version of yourself. No job is really going to be safe from this in the future, even McJobs, where we see automation occurring in this space right now. But you put all of this together, and it sounds pretty disruptive, but it represents a pretty exciting era for humanity. But think about this. You know, what are some of the changes we might have? What about if London bans human drivers from the city centre in the future because humans are no longer safe? They're too risky compared with an autonomous vehicle. Is this possible? It's possible. What about 3D bioprinted organs like you know, having heart transplants made from 3D printed tissue. You know, we've been working on this technology. We're not there yet, but in 10, 15, 20 years, 
we'll be able to do this. In 10 years, we'll be replacing kidneys. In 20 years, we'll be looking at potentially heart transplants. What does this do to transplant lists in the future? What does it do to the uh, rejection uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical industry when you now can print these replacement organs using your own biotissue so it doesn't get rejected? These are pretty significant changes that we're uh, working on. But on 3D printers, the initial 3D printers that we developed cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and would take hours to print very basic uh, things. Today you can print a house. You can print a 3D printed house in less than 12 hours. Uh, for the cost of, and the, the 3D printers are less than $10,000. You can buy a, a printer at home, a 3D printer at home for less than $1,000 that can make simple components these days from, from various plastics. But the biggest opportunities are in new businesses and new industries that will grow out of this smart infrastructure layer. So just in the same time that we've created 50,000 coal jobs in the United States, we've also created 1.2 million jobs in the renewable sector. That's the news you don't really hear about. But globally, you can imagine you know, this is going to be a massive employer. But as, uh, and, and as uh, weather impact increases, you can see... Puerto Rico now. Elon Musk is going to Puerto Rico to put uh, battery technology in, uh, potentially. We have Google uh, putting uh, balloons in to supply uh, LTE telecoms and wireless into these. Smart infrastructure is going to be a part of the solution when we look at climate, the damage around climate shift and so forth as well. So when it comes to your businesses in the future, Really, your businesses are going to become data businesses in the future because diagnostics that lead you to give the best quality of care to your patients is going to be on the right data. Right now, today, you are the data processing unit that processes that data to make a diagnosis for your customers. But in the future, that's going to be transitioned to work in concert with artificial intelligence and this diagnosis technology. That's really an interesting shift for you guys because you wouldn't have thought of your business as a technology business, but in the future, that's how you're going to have to remain competent. You're going to have to become a technology business as well. But I'll leave you with the one last thought. This is uh, the Atlas program that Boston Dynamics has been working on, a bipedal robot. Um, it's sponsored by DARPA, so there's obviously military applications and so forth, but I will just say that you know, in the future, if there are going to be 10 billion robots and robots reach uh, self-awareness, um, you don't want to be the guy that's caught on video hitting the robot with a hockey stick. You know? uh, but it is interesting to sort of think about this future that we have. We are going to have to live with technology around us. That's if 200 years of technology disruption has taught us anything. It's that that level of technology disruption is largely inevitable. No one has ever successfully stopped it, even though they've tried. And in the future, we won't be able to stop the technology impact on the business that you guys are in either. So if we embrace that, then that gives us an advantage in respect to our services in the future. If you want to know a little bit more about the technologies that are going to change the world over the future, then uh, come over to the stand. We're going to do a book signing in the, after the session today, and you can get a copy of uh, my book, Augmented Life in the Smart Lane. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.